I want to start a new series on healing called God's Will to Heal. God's Will to Heal. Now, it's only going to be two or three parts, but I believe it'll be profound and I believe it'll speak to you. And open up your hearts and your minds to be ready to receive what God has this morning. We're going to answer that question this morning. Is it God's will to heal? How many just in here would say that it is God's will to heal? Okay, and that, that's, that's most of us. So uh, we're already at that spot, but we're going to go over that for those that aren't and that are listening, and then also just it helps to solidify in your mind because you can conquer doubt and unbelief when you know and you have it established that God, it is, in fact, God's will to heal. And, you know, I know that when we start talking about healing, a lot of uh, may, maybe examples or situations comes up where we go, okay, well, this one didn't get healed or that one. Bear with me. We are going to get to some of those things and talk about some of that. Do I have all the answers? No, but I know who does, and that's God. A a amen. And some of them we get to know here, and some of them we don't. We'll know way later. But we're going to go over what our responsibility and our job is in terms of healing. Amen. It's, it's going to be good. I'm excited about it. And I want to say a few things about covenant before, just, just briefly before we get into healing. And I know my father's talked about covenant a little bit in the, in the series, uh, the prepared series we did. And if you missed any of that, be sure, get online, churchpluggedin.com, and, and then click on the YouTube page there at the top. There's a little banner, you know, and you click there, go to that. And, and listen to those. But before we start, let's pray one more time. Father, this morning, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is life. It is life. It is medicine unto us. And so, Lord, right now, we just open up our minds. We open up our hearts ready to receive what you have. And we come against every distraction and command it to go in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for an anointing and the flow of your spirit ministering to each person, Lord, as we open ourselves up to you this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So the term covenant is of Latin origin, meaning a coming together. It means two or more parties coming together to form uh, a contract, agreeing on promises, stipulations, privileges, and responsibilities. Now, in terms of, of a biblical uh, covenant, it's stronger than just what man's little contracts do. When we sign on the dotted line, when we buy a house, or we this or that. And, uh, but in terms of, of covenant in the Word, it's more, of, it's, it's more relational. And it's, it's really, it's essentially, it is a relationship. It, but it's a relationship that's been formalized and it's brought under sanctions, so to speak. So there's blessings that come if the relationship is kept, if covenant is kept. But then there's also penalties that come if the relationship is broken. How many know that Paul said you reap what you sow? Now God's not up, up there with a lightning bolt zapping you. We do it to ourselves. The, a, a, amen. See, so that we need to get this idea that God is judging us out, out, out the window. And listen, this whole thing of, you know, uh, sickness and disease, since we're talking about, I'll just go ahead and start right now with this and throw this out there, that it is not God's judgment on you. Amen. We'll just start right there with that. Amen. We just need to squash that. And we're going to squash that some more later. Amen. So there's blessings that come if the relationship is kept. There's penalties that come that we bring upon ourselves if the relationship is broken. And a covenant is simply the terms of that relationship. Now, look at this statement here. Everything that God does is based on covenant. Everything that God does is based on covenant. And we know this from Scripture. Now, we don't have time to get in all the Scriptures to back this up. What I'll say to you if you're like, I don't know if that's true or not. I want you to go research Get into the Word and look at it. From the very beginning, God made covenant starting in Genesis. From the beginning. Now, he didn't use the word covenant in Genesis. It's a little more, but you can see the wording as when you go over and you start getting into the Mosaic covenant and, and what is it, the, you know, uh, Noah and all the different ones that he did. So, and David, right? So he made covenant with all of those and the wording, and then you go back and you look in the, in the beginning of Genesis there and you see, oh my goodness, okay, right from creation, from the start, God made covenant with man. A a amen? So it was from the very beginning, and everything that he does is based on covenant. Now, we see the covenants that God made with his people throughout the Old Testament, like I mentioned, Noah and, 
and, and Moses and David. But however, Jesus is the covenantal, or covenantal, so to speak, climax, if you will. He is the ultimate covenant that we have. It, it is the ultimate of all covenants that, that's ever been in the word. word. And the ultimate covenant that's ever been made between two individuals or two, two, two parties, we'll say, in, in, in the universe. And it's the covenant between man and Jesus. I, I mean, there's nothing that, that's higher than that covenant right there. Nothing higher. And so, what is that? We see this and we see that we're under a new covenant that brings total forgiveness and see, everybody, we know this because we're saved, we believe in God, we're here. And, and most of you listening online, you, I believe you're, you're probably saved. And we know, okay, yes, I have the forgiveness of sins. But see, it's a cleansing from that sin, from that shame, based on what Jesus did. It's based on what he did and the covenant he made with us. So now we don't have to have shame. I don't have to walk and live in that shame. I remember when you were real little and your mom and dad, you know, they got on to you and they, and they really got on because you, you broke or the jar or you got into the cookie jar because you wanted a cookie or whatever it was. You broke the commandment in the house, so to speak. You disobeyed and you're little and you hung your head. And I remember the first time I really got on, I mean, I, I kind of sternly raised my voice to Joshua, my firstborn son. Here he is, he's little. We're at um, my mother-in-law's house, and he's crawling. Okay, he couldn't even walk yet. He's crawling around and getting into everything, and there was a plug. You know, it's not all baby-proofed in her house. See, we had it all baby-proofed at my house. I could set him down in the, in the room, the TV room, and sit there and pick up, you know, a magazine or something and, and not even look at it, and he's not going to get hurt. I mean, we got, man, these days we got padding for everything, every corner. We've got every drawer. We've got the, the, the shelves tacked up. I mean, all the bottom shelves just have toys on them. We don't have anything breakable on the bottom. But see, we go to the mother-in-law's house, and, you know, and there's this plug. And he went over to it, and I said, Joshua, no, like that. And he looked at me. He just looked and stared, and he stayed right there. And he was waiting for me to look away from him and to continue my conversation. And I thought, okay, this, this, this boy's going to test me right now in my mother-in-law's house. And so I turned my head to make him think I wasn't going to turn back. And then I looked right out of the corner of my eye. And there he went. I went, uh, boy, no. Just like that, real stern. He looked over at me again. And that bottom lip started to quiver. You know. And he's crying. And his head went down in shame. See. So see, I shamed him. In front of everybody else. See, when we, and here's the thing God doesn't shame us. In other words, I don't have to feel shame. Well, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, we feel the Spirit gently tell us, no, not do this. That. But see, because of the covenant I have with God, I don't have to stay in shame. I don't have to lay my head down and cry for 10 minutes. I mean, my son sat there and just cried and cried and cried, going on and on. And he just felt so, and he had to put his head down, saying how sorry he was. And he just stayed there. <laughs> see, see, I don't have to do that. And he doesn't, see, he doesn't know, he doesn't understand. He's in diapers. He doesn't know that immediately, I already forgave him before he even did it. But does he know? No. He didn't know. See, he learned as he got older, Dad, oh, he loves me. He forgives me right away. And see, I forget, I, I taught my children, I forgive you right away, right away, right away. But see, with God... None of this is in the notes at all. Listen to this. But we see, with God, but I believe it's important. Because, see, 
when he corrects or he shows us something and we know we haven't done something wrong, he does not stay with that. He doesn't sit there all mad, upset, none of that. He's, not, he, he's already forgave me before he even corrected me. Before his spirit showed me I did something, he's already forgiven me. He is forgiveness. And so because I already have that forgiveness, I don't have to stay in shame. So God doesn't shame us. The moment I make a course correction, immediately I begin to feel better in my spirit. Immediately I begin to feel better. Where I feel, felt bad just a minute ago, all of a sudden, real fast, I don't have to sit there and cry and go on and on with my head down because <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> if he's going to forgive me. I, I don't have to do that. I'm not a child, little, little child anymore. I'm not a baby anymore. I've grown. I understand. I'm in the Word. I understand God's forgiveness. It's His covenant with me, and it is an everlasting covenant till the end of time. A a amen. In Hebrews 8, 6, it says, But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. And Dad read this, but I'm reading it in New Living Translation. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. We're under a better covenant. And there are many blessings included in the new covenant. All you got to do is start reading it, Matthew chapter 1, and just keep on reading and you begin to see, and you begin to pluck out this scripture, that one here, and begin to see the promises under the new covenant and see that this is far better than what I read back over a few pages to the left. Now, and in church, it's not just the forgiveness of sins. There's many blessings of the new covenant that were even foretold by the prophets in the Old Testament. See, I want to I look at a few verses in Isaiah 53, but... And, and, and many of you are familiar with these verses. We've heard these before if you've been churched. Amen. Right? Okay? So we know what Isaiah 53 is. But I want you to hear what uh, a theologian, his name's Adam Clark, what he says about this chapter. He says this. This chapter foretells the sufferings of the Messiah, the end for which he was to die, and the advantages resulting to mankind. The advantages resulting to mankind from that illustrious event. This chapter contains a beautiful summary of the most peculiar and distinguishing doctrines of Christianity. And it's a wonderful chapter, and we don't have time to get into all of it. But what we're going to do is read verse 4 and 5, New King James Version. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, talking about Jesus, and sorrows right there means physical and mental, okay? Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now go back up to verse 4 where it says, Surely he's borne our griefs. Now I want you to understand the important thing about these verses is that Jesus suffered and died under the weight of our sin. I want, I want you to understand that. That's the most important thing in this chapter. It's the most important thing in this, these verses that we are now free from all sin and shame. Mm, that's so good. But look at the word griefs there. In the Hebrew, it means sickness. Now, see, most of the words here, you know, is going to be dealing with our, our, our transgressions, dealing with our sin, dealing with our, our mental sorrows, you know, those kind of things. But, we have this word griefs here, and it literally means sickness. It's translated as sickness in 12 other places and as disease in seven other places. But the literal translation of the word grief there is sickness. And there are many translations that go ahead and just put the word sickness right there. Okay? Now, verse 5, where it says, by his stripes we are healed. How many's heard this one before? Okay, I want to read from my notes again from another theologian, and actually it's a mixture of a couple of theologians here. And so I, I want to read this straight from my notes. It says, There has been much debate as to if Isaiah had in mind spiritual healing or physical healing. 
As this passage is quoted in the New Testament, we see some more of the thought. In Matthew 8, 16 through 17, the view seems to be of physical healing. In 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25, the view seems to be of spiritual healing. We can safely say that God has both aspects of healing in view, and both our physical and spiritual healing is provided for by the suffering of Jesus. Now understand, and also in what I fall back on, is in verse 4, this word with griefs, meaning literal sickness. So he bore this, where? On the cross. So we've heard that phrase and we say, he has nailed our sins to the cross. He's, guess what? He's also nailed your sickness to the cross. Amen. Amen. So what does this mean for us? It means our salvation and our healing from sickness and diseases have been paid for on the cross. Therefore, just as you have a right as a child of God to be free from sin, you also have the right to be free from sickness and disease. In other words, healing is a covenant right of the believer. And see, look, this is why we had to start with covenant before we get into the other scriptures, talking about God's will to heal and answering that question. Because first we need to see that from the, it, was, it was from the, the very beginning of the covenant that we have with Jesus that we are to be free from sickness and disease in the same way that we are free from our sin and our shame. Now, now this is good. Amen. Let's look at Luke Chapter 5, verse 12. Now we're going to just deal with and answer this question. Is it God's will to heal? Go ahead and black the screen out for me for a minute. Is it God's will to heal? Not during the Acts. You know, when what Peter and John came and Peter saw the man there who was, uh, you know, the beggar at the, at the gate and he was crippled. And he said, silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I thee. Rise up and walk. Not just then. Not just when Jesus healed people. Not just when Elijah and Elijah healed people and the prophets healed people. And he said, go dip in the Jordan. What was it, seven times, right? He said, "All all these examples, not just during when the Bible Says, you know, when, it, when that was being, uh, when those events were happening that we read in the Bible. Is it God's will to heal today, right now? Is it God's will to heal today? Look at this in Luke chapter 5, verse 12, verse 13. And it happened when he was in a certain city, and behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, I love this. I love this a lot. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. Good stuff. Good stuff. My mom had shared a message with me from a minister, and I was, I was listening to some of this, and I'm gleaning some of this from his message. And I, I'm going to tell you, I, I really could feel the presence of the Lord when he was reading this particular verse. And what he was pointing out here. You know, because sometimes I just, and I am so guilty of this many times. And I know, because there's so much in the Bible. There's so much there. There's so many verses, so many chapters. And I just read over things sometimes and I just don't, I don't, I don't see certain words. I don't see certain things. And so I listen to other ministers from time to time, different ones, not a lot. And I'm like, wow, I didn't see that. Or I'm in my studies and I'm looking at a certain verse that I've read ten times before and then I saw something I didn't see before. Totally illumination. Total illumination to my mind. Now I'm illuminated. Now I understand. And now I understand more than I did last week. (laughs) Amen. This is good. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then he put his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed immediately. The leprosy left him, full of leprosy. Leprosy was a skin disease that ate away the flesh. There was two different kinds. One was uh, a skin disease that that just went all over. It was a little bit less severe, but but there was another one that started in one area, and it began to just eat away at your body. Either one, both was still, it it was a bad 
uh, condition. You were ostracized. Society scorned lepers. The law stated that you could not be within six foot of a leper. They were generally put on a certain place outside of the city, outside the gates. Okay? This is when you, you know, research and look at leprosy. It was awful. And this leper, though, he found Jesus. That's the right direction to go. When you've been scorned, when you are dealing with disease, go to Jesus. And then he said, if you are willing. Millions of Christians, I, I mean, they're in the same boat. And I've been in that boat before. Where I've asked the Lord, and I've been like with this leper, if you're willing, Lord. Look, I'm here in socks. I've got a, 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 they say it's a rare disease that I'm dealing with right now. And I've been like the leopard in the past and said, Lord, if you're willing, I'm ready. Anytime. I, I've done all that. I've been where this leper is. Not exactly like that. But I, I've, I've been there in certain, to a certain extent. And millions of Christians have been in the same boat. I know that you can heal me if, if you're willing. But see, he put forth his hands and touched him. And that speaks volumes. It speaks volumes because here's this man who's hurting. This man who has just an awful condition all over his body. And no one is allowed to be within six foot. No one would dare touch a leper. They would dare touch them. Church, we've just been through a pandemic, and I believe we're starting to come out of it with COVID and stuff. What do we do when someone has COVID? Go, we, we separate them, right? We don't want to be near them, right? We don't want to do anything, right? Because we know that it can be a deadly disease or a deadly virus. I'm sorry. So it can be deadly, right? So they have this room right here in this school in the back. It's an isolation room and both doors are closed and they got a warning on there because if anybody here in the school tests positive for COVID at the nurse's station, they bring them down to this room and set them right there until mom and dad comes gets them because we don't want them right now. Come get them. I'm serious. The man who opens the door for me said, TJ, I wouldn't go in that room with a hazmat suit on. That's how many COVID germs are probably in that room. Don't walk in there. Because <laughs> I was asking him, hey, when can we use that room? And he was like, oh, no, 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 you don't want to use that room, right? You know, because you know, that was our nursery room. You know. Don't worry, that's not going to be the nursery room for a long time, okay? <laughs> don't worry, we're not putting your babies in the COVID room, <laughs> okay? We're not. <laughs> it's not happening. But imagine this. This, this leprosy, this awful thing, and you're, you're scorned, you're on the outskirts, of, and it's not like you've got the whatever, how many days they say that, that you're, you're good with COVID. No, you have this, and it's, you got it. That's it. There was no cure for leprosy. There was no nothing. Jesus laid hands on him. Why did he lay hands on him? Because he loved him. The moment... He laid eyes on him. He loved him. That's how I know Jesus is willing to heal. You know, I remember years ago, we were at a church event, and we were at one of the, uh, I, I, some, one of the leaders in that church at the time, one of his house. And um, I, went, I, I was driving in the car, and I had picked up one of the young people. I think he was like, I don't think he was in my youth group yet. He was like 11. And he's in my car, and I'm driving him there, and he's not feeling too good, you know, at his stomach. And I'm like, man, I hope this kid does not barf in my car. I have no bag. I have nothing. Okay? And he's sitting in the front seat right next to me, and I'm like, oh, man, you know. So we're driving. We pull up to the house, and we get out. And, 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 you know, I'm like, I, you know, he gets out, and he's getting out really slow out of the car. I'm like, please get out. Please get out. You know? 
So I, go, I shut his door. I'm already on the other side. I'm moving quick because I'm like, I don't know when this dude's going to lose it. And so I got my hand on his back. I'm like, okay, we're going to get you up to the house. We're going to get you up to see your mom, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I'm going to pass you to your mama. <laughs> he loses it, at, I mean, three steps in. After, as soon as I got my hand on his back, he starts losing it. You know, and some of the splatter gets on my shoe and all this stuff. And, and I can see the grimaces right now. <laughs> You know, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, and I'm just like doing this, you know, trying to hold him up, you know. I mean, he's 11, he's, he's upset, he's not, you know, his mom, blah, blah, blah. So I finally, I get him up to the house, and I'm cleaning off my shoe in the bathroom, and I'm doing all this. And I was thinking, that was disgusting, you know. And I was like, I just throw up and stuff, oh, it just, oh, it just bothers me, I can't, uh, uh, uh. And, and, you know, in my mouth, I'm going, you know, a little bit. You know, I'm just like, oh, and the smell, and eh, da, 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 you know, and I'm just like, uh, right? Okay, this, this was a long time ago. Then I had kids. I want you to know, look, your whole world changes when you have children. One of your babies ain't feeling good, what do you do? Look, you ain't even putting a mask on. You ain't doing nothing. You're just, the first thing you do is you put your arms around that kid. I, I mean, it just, it's that way. Because you love him so much or love her so much. They're little, you know, they're sick. Oh, they spit up. Oh, no big deal. You're just wiping it up, right? You're not freaking out. And every time, every time. Church, I can't tell you how many times I've caught throw up with my shirt so it wouldn't hit the floor. Because of the carpet and cleaning it on the car. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I've done it over and over. And you know what? And we are talking like dozens of times. I had four kids, okay? Dozens of times. And not one time with all of their throw up did I ever, or anything like that, just, did, ex, no, no, except there was, there was this once. I'm not going to, I'll tell you later what separate if you want. There was this once. But all the other times, not one time. And that once, just so you know, is because I was eating. Anyways, um, but, but see, it did. But why? I was so disgusted before I was married. I was so disgusted with all of it. I couldn't be around. It, could be, it was just like, ugh. And it would just make me come. I love my children so much, I'll do anything for them. And if, no matter what they do, I will always love them. See, God's children is on this earth. It's his creation. Do you understand that? Listen, when Jesus looked at that man, he had a love for the, that man because he was God and man. See, he was God. He had a love for him that transcended anybody else's love for him except for his mama. You know what I mean? And so see, I, when God, he looks and he says, I am willing. That's what he's saying to you. You are his child. And he says, I am willing. I love you. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Throw up and all. Amen. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Look, this really happened. It's not a fairy tale. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He hasn't changed. If Jesus was standing here right now, and you went up and asked him, Lord, would you heal me? What do you think he would say? He would say, yes. And the answer is still, yes. He's here today. He's within you. He's within me. The answer is yes, I am willing. I love it. This is, notice another word in this verse. Oh, we're good. we'll get there. I'm sorry. I'll skip forward. Woo! Let's keep going. Some people teach that it's not always God's will to heal. But where's the scripture that says that? Uh, where is one scripture that says God won't heal someone? It, it doesn't exist. Church, I looked for it. I actually Googled it this week just for fun, just to see if there was anybody out there that could prove it and show it. 
every single person out there talking about God doesn't heal, every bit of it is based on their own, their own thoughts, their own uh, way of thinking, uh, their own interpretation. They have nothing to back it up with. Every single person that went, now look here, understand what I'm saying, that actually went to Jesus got healed. Every single one. You never see someone coming to Jesus saying, will you heal, heal me? And then he, and he said, no. Now look, he went to his own hometown, remember? And he couldn't do m many miracles there except for just healing a few sick folk. Why? Because the familiarity with him. They knew him as a child. They were like, who's this? Blah, blah. They kind of blew him off. They didn't have the faith, church. He left. But every person who came to him wanting healing was healed. There's many ministers and Christians that pray for other people and say, Lord, heal them if it be your will. And if not, thy will be done. I, I don't pray that way. I don't pray that way. Just like I don't pray for the unsaved and say, save them if it be thy will. Why do I not pray for the unsaved that way? Because the scripture says that God doesn't want anybody to perish. In 2 Peter 3.9 it says it's God's will that all would come to know him. God loves the whole world. He wants everybody saved. Church, God wants everybody saved. Church, God wants everybody healed. Amen. It's our covenant right. Now, look, we don't need to pray with it, if it be thy will, for healing or for salvation. If you don't agree with what I'm preaching right now, please find a scripture to support your position and show it to me. I'm open. I really am. But see, just like you're, it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, church, I'm working out my healing right now. I, you got to let that sink in. Because, see, that answers so many questions, right? And we're going to get there a little bit more. How much time? Whew, goodness. How do we find the will of God? Millions believe that everything that has happened and everything that will happen is the will of God. How many's heard that one before? Oh, yeah. Heard that one. But, see, the will of God is... It, you know, to them, it's like it's determined by the results of things that happen. But they only believe it about certain things, really, when you get to talking to them. They usually don't believe it about salvation. What if we believe that about salvation? Oh, well, how do we know if it was so-and-so's will to be saved or not? Well, when we get to heaven, I guess we'll find out if he went to heaven or he went to the other place. It, you know, it's not... We don't do that. We don't do it with salvation. Look at this statement. You can't ascertain what the will of God is by the things that happen. And if we don't do this with salvation, why do we do it with healing? People say, everything happens for a reason. How many has ever said that one? Don't raise your hand. Don't tell on yourself. But how many has ever said that one? Oh, it must have happened for a reason. That's baloney. As the reason why, oh, oh, something happened. But it's also just like, duh, yeah, everything does happen for a re There's a reason something happened. It's, 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 it's the same as saying it snowed yesterday. Well, yeah, it did. We see it on the ground. It, it doesn't matter. It, this whole idea of, oh, things happen for, nowhere in scripture do we ever see that we're supposed, and think, we're supposed to think, oh, things happen for a reason. That, no. That's not how we're supposed to fall back on when something bad happens. That's what we say. We say that when every time something bad happens, we say, 
Oh, well, it, everything happens for a reason. It must have been a re- uh, He must have had a plan for no, Well, look, God can turn all things around for good, and we know that. And we know that, you know, God can make good out of a bad situation, or we can learn from bad si- But that we don't need to be saying these types of things as excuses or for reasons when bad things happen. Oh, just everything ha- God's and See, what that is is God's in control, and he's not. He's in charge. There's a difference. I don't control everything my children do, and God doesn't control everything we do. I got this headache. It hurts so bad. Must be God's will. What what kind of darkness is that? Oh, I got this headache. It must be for a reason. Yeah, it's because you didn't open the window when you were painting, fool. I love that one. You know, it's like, Phil, isn't it true when you paint, you have to open the window in there to get some ventilation? It says it on the can. But you know us men, we don't always read the directions, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's like, what in the world, you know? But, But it's true. We bring it on ourselves so many times, and we go, well, it must just be for a reason. Well, it must have been God's will. No, it's not. We don't. We got to stop saying that for when bad things happen. Look at Romans twelve two, and do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove means test and find out. What are you going to find out? The good and perfect will of God. You need your mind renewed by the Word to distinguish what the will of God is. Not this just flippant thing and not being in the Word. And we just go, well, oh, must have happened for a reason. No, we need to be in the Word so we know why stuff's happening happening amen and no it's not god's will for russia to invade ukraine it wasn't god's will for you know this person over here to be killed or murdered it's not this do you understand it's not god's will notice another word in this verse good in other words the will of god is what good see if we read the word we can get rid of the silliness If we read the Word, because the will of God is good. So when all these bad things happen, we can't just start saying all this stuff to throw it back on God. Or God just knows stuff we don't know. Well, that's true. But that doesn't mean it was His will. Amen. I'm preaching to somebody. Look, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, just some examples here. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality is not the will of God. We know that. Look, we can't pick and choose what we think is the will of God. We've got to go by what the Word says. Are there people fornicating? Yeah, there's people doing it this second, I'm sure. Right? Well, it must be the will of God. No, it's not. We just read it. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And look, when bad stuff happens, we've got to stop saying that stuff. Amen. First Thessalonians, church, we, we need our minds renewed by the Word of God. First Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How many's ever complained before? Was it God's will for you to complain? Look, I've done it once. Okay, fine. Maybe twice. But you know, it wasn't God's will when I was complaining. Listen to this statement. If it's God's will for you to be healed, then it's not His will for you to be sick. Uh, just, just put that in there. Don't be sick. I, look, when my feet are burning, which they are starting to burn right now, I don't go, well, it must be God's will. He's got a purpose in it somehow. No, it, his will is not for me to have my feet burning and being uncomfortable. His will is not for you to be sick, dealing with that pain, that sharp pain, and the doctor has no idea how to you know, take care of it. And look, I am not anti-doctor. Let me tell you something. God works and moves through doctors. I believe that. Where do you think they got the knowledge to do what they do? 
it, it's, it's because God created them, and now they, their minds are so smart, they were good enough, and they were disciplined enough to go through medical school and do that. I thank God for doctors. And the moment we start throwing off on doctors is when we miss it. Look, I thank God for doctors, but I know who's better than all the earthly doctors, and that's Dr. Jesus. Amen? Who nailed our sickness to the cross. So just in the same way I'm working out my salvation, I'm believing God for my healing. Amen? See, for healing and prosperity, you know, it's just, it's, it's not consistent. People aren't consistent. When it comes to healing and prosperity, they don't know if it's God's will for them. They're not sure. But with salvation, it's like, oh, oh yeah, that's God's will. But see, it's all, all those things are in the Word. In Ephesians 5.17, it says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So should we find out? Should we seek to find out or stay ignorant of what God's will is? Where do we go to find the will of God? It's in the Word. When the Word says that Jesus laid hands on the leper and said, I will, what does that mean to you? I believe it's the will of God being revealed to all mankind for all of time. That's what I believe that's saying to me. Look at this statement here. If you have to see before you believe it, then you are too late for faith. Faith believes even when it looks impossible. Think about it. If we knew everything and everything was assured and we, and we knew everything in the, in the Scripture and we understood it all, we understood God completely. Oh, but we just understood. What would be the need for faith? There wouldn't be a need for it. It's simply because He said it when He says, I will. I want to read that one more time in Luke chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. This time in the Living Bible. It says, On a day in a certain village he was visiting, there was a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell to the ground before him, face downward in the dust, being begging to be healed. Sir, he said, if you only will, you can clear me of every trace of my disease. Jesus reached out and touched the man and said, Of course I will. Be healed. And the leprosy left him instantly. Of course I will. What about the man or the woman who goes before God in the same way and says, save me? What does he say? Of course I will. What about the man that comes or the woman that has the disease and he says, Lord, are you willing to heal me? The answer is, of course I will. I, I, I like that too. Two healing principles before I let you go. Number one, what we've been talking about, talking about know that healing is his will. That's number one. Two, what's been provided by grace must be received by faith. I got, I got one or two amens. Listen to this. What's been provided by grace must be received by faith. Look, that's how we're saved, church. We're saved by grace through faith. That's what the scripture says in Romans. It says that we have to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? We confess him as Lord by faith and then we receive that grace of God. And that's that, that infilling of His Spirit begins to come into us. We are now the temple of God at that moment. Right? Amen? And we feel, diff we feel different. Look at this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 through 30. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed Him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when He had come into the house, they said to Him, Yes, Lord. Or, or wait a minute, when they come into the house, the blind man came to him and Jesus said to him, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. I love that answer, yes. In verse 29, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. Church, so faith is important. It is important. He said, well, man, TJ, I lack faith. Look, remember, just as dad was talking, he said, look, he got up at church years ago. I mean, I was little, right? And he, he's, he's preaching, and he said, you know, come down front for healing, and nobody moved. He said, look, if you don't have faith, it's okay. I got faith for it. Come down front, and everybody came down. He began to pray for them, and they got healed. Faith somewhere is important. A amen? It's true. Now, verse Mark 9, verse 17. How many can give me three more minutes, right? Three more? 
three more. Then one in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And, when, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they couldn't do it. And he answered and said, Oh, faithless generation. Th- think about that. That's harsh, right? Oh, faithless generation, how long shall it be? How, sh- how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately his spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, how long has, he, has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both in the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now we're going to come back to there. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, and come out of him and enter to him no more. And the spirit cried and convulsed him greatly, and it came out. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. In verse 23, all things are possible to him who believes. Again, faith is important. Now, Jesus healed a lot of people. He healed multitudes. But there's only about 19 accounts in Scripture where there's some detail of what happened to them and how they were healed. In 10 of the 19 accounts that we see, the individual's faith was specifically referred to. In 6 of the accounts, it doesn't mention the person having faith, but you can see it. For instance, Jesus said to the woman with the issue of blood, Your faith has made you whole. The ten lepers in Luke 17, Your faith has made you whole. He told Jairus, whose daughter died, He said, Fear not, believe only. Jesus then went and rose her from the dead. Church, faith is important. Now look back really quick. I know I said three minutes, two more. Verse 24 Immediately the father of the uh, child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus said, do you believe? But he said, help my unbelief. Jesus healed him despite his struggle. Church, it's okay to struggle as long as you're not giving up and staying there and you're, you're focused on building your faith. It's okay, though, to go to God and say, God, help my unbelief. That's okay. Get in the Word while praying and saying, God, help my unbelief. Look, this man, that's where he was. If that's where you are, that's okay. I condemn you not. Jesus didn't condemn that man. I condemn you not if that's where you are, but I want to implore you, don't stay there. Get in the Word, renew your mind, build your faith to the point where on the, it's the other examples, not this one example, there's one in the Scripture where he says, help my unbelief, but the others, they went to Jesus and he said, do you believe? And they said, yes, I do. Get to the point where you said, yes, I believe. Now I'm not going back on that no matter what, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, I'm saying, yes, I believe. But if you're here today and you're in the struggle, I say to you, that's okay. That's okay. Stick with us for next week and maybe the next. I think we're going to two or three, something like that. Hallelujah. And begin to cast out the doubt and unbelief. Church, what's absent from all these accounts is that it's not the will of God for you to be healed. That is absent. You don't see it. Or it's up to God if he heals you or not. So we'll just have to wait and see. Your faith in Jesus will make you whole according to your faith. Jesus said this over and over and over again. It's the same as salvation. Faith in Jesus will make you saved. Hallelujah. In church, we're going to go over and we're going to look. Let's all stand. We're going to look next week and we'll talk a little bit more about where it says in Proverbs chapter 4 it says the word of God maybe just go there go ahead Aaron right there at the end Proverbs 4 20 because we've got some other stuff to do we go I'm skipping here but 
my son, atten- give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Another, one more reason why we're sure it's God's will to, will to be healed is that this word health in the Hebrew literally means medicine, or abstractly it means cure. Look at this statement, God's word is medicine. If you're sick, take your medicine, your pills, swallow them, take your NyQuil, whatever you got to do, it's fine. Choke whatever down, you got to choke down. But, but, even more than doing all of that, you better be in the Word. The Word is medicine. In church, I stand before you today, I need more of it. I need more medicine. It's that simple. You know, I'll study and I'll get bogged in it, but I, sometimes I just need to read I just need to look over. I need to do that more. I'm I'm admitting that right now. I need more medicine. I need God's medicine. And look, it's not just the healing scriptures. It's all of it. The word of God is medicine. It'll minister to you. It will help you, whatever it is that you're in need of. It's not just those healing scriptures. It's the whole word. Now, with the last statement I'm putting on the screen, because I want us to understand this as we pray. Our responsibility is to believe what God says in His Word. That's it. That's it. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what it feels like. And see, with healing, it's hard because if you got a pain or this or that, you know, you feel that. But see, we do this in other areas, you know, we're believing God for funds or we're believing God for this miracle or this person to be saved. We're nice and patient and we're waiting, right? And we're still in faith and we're believing. But when it comes to healing, for some reason, boy, that's a struggle. It's hard. And church, I've been there. I'm not struggling anymore. I know exactly what I believe, which is, I am healed. Because it is the word, uh, it is the will of God, it's in his word, and when I asked him, he said, of course I will. And so now I'm believing it. Well, am I, I going to keep taking medicine? Am I going to do treatment? Look, I got antibodies treatment this week, the next four days, starting tomorrow. The nurses come into my house. I'm hooked up, and they're pumping it in. I don't even, I don't know. I, they sent a big box. I got medical supplies over half of my dining room for the week. I'm not telling you to drop all that stuff. What I'm telling you is to pick up the word and believe the word. That's our responsibility. How many in here will say, TJ, I know that it is God's will to heal, and I'm going to believe God from this day forward for every healing I need. Come on. That you're going to believe God. You're going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. Look, and if, you're, if you need it right now, keep your hand up. If you need a healing right now, we're going to pray. We're going to believe God. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, and those listening online, just do the same. Just begin to pray and believe sitting in your living room, your bedroom, in your nightie, whatever you're in. I don't care. Believe God right now with me. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, and Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Lord, to die for our salvation, but you also paid the price for our sicknesses and our diseases, and Lord, we know that you nailed those on that cross, and so Father, right now, we say, we believe you when you said, of course, I will, and we choose to build our faith and to have faith this day and to build our faith going, moving forward by being in your word and allowing your medicine, Lord, to heal us and to build our faith. And we just come against doubt. We come against unbelief. We put it under our feet. We put it behind us in the rearview mirror. And Father, Lord, as we begin to build our faith, I thank you that that doubt and unbelief is smaller and smaller and smaller. And we come against the voice of the enemy that comes to bring that doubt, that lying devil. We command you to cease your activity now. You can no longer speak to God's people in this church saying those doubting words we break it now in Jesus name 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Father God, we will speak nothing but your word and what your word says from this day forward because we believe you when you said, of course, I will. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.